I'm Zach Martin. This is the Big Fat American Rock Show podcast. We have a very special guest, the legendary Lee Abrams. I don't even think I have to tell anybody who you are, but maybe somebody's listening because they found us on LinkedIn and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard the name. Who is Lee Abrams? Well, I've uh, just been in the trenches for a long time. I started back in uh, mid-60s managing bands in Chicago and we used to do research to see what, uh, outside of the VFW halls and bar mitzvahs, to see what the band should be playing. And we discovered an interesting thing back then, and that was a lot of guys, mainly guys between about 15 and 18 or so, were rejecting what was top 40 at the time uh, and really embracing the new sound, which didn't really have a name. But it was uh, other than Beatlemania, but it was the Beatles, obviously, the Stones, the Animals, Yardbirds, and the groups like that. And that um, sound kept evolving. And in uh, 57, 68, if you knew Cream was or Hendrix was, you were really in the know. And then by about 1969, you know, all hell broke loose. and We had a cultural and musical revolution. And it all uh, musically sort of started in the middle 60s with those bands like the Yardbirds. And uh, so we created a radio format geared to um, reach the fans of this new music and uh, the idea was to be as commercial as possible without losing its progressive identity. And it was on FM. And the way we did that was um, initially change the familiar, familiarity factor from song, which was the case with Top 40 you know, throughout its history, to artist. So you could play a whole you know, deep catalog of the artists at the time, that were popular at the time. Uh, for example, if you play Hendrix, it's uh, you know it's not necessarily all along the Watchtower, which gets got banged to death back then in the top forty, but be his whole whole collection, and um, that evolved into what was called AOR, and would kind of waltz in any market in the country, and uh, you know the timing was great, just do amazingly well because uh, all there was was top forty or the occasional underground station, which. Um, you know, those stations were fine, but we were far more mass appeal and uh, very successful. And then uh, things evolved and uh, consulted a lot of products uh, like Rolling Stone magazine and uh, Swatch Watch and consulted, uh, advised a lot of artists like Yes and the Moody Blues on uh, not on what kind of music to play, but on their marketing strategy and uh, things like that. And then uh, joined the Satellite Music Network. And what we were uh, doing there was creating formats out of Dallas, and they were beamed up to a satellite, then beamed down to mainly small and medium market stations who would rebroadcast them, the satellite feed locally. And it was very efficient, very effective, and uh, provided great radio for um, smaller markets. But probably the biggest thing uh, to come along was I was actually the first employee at XM Satellite Radio, and the mission there was to just reinvent radio. If people were going to pay for it, it had better be amazing. And I think we were able to create some amazing stations. We had, a, you know, we handpicked the staff, and uh, we had, oh God, two or two years or so before we had to go on the air. So everybody was really trained and uh, educated into the XM way, and it was really enlightening for people. Then when we hit the air, it was, you know, I thought it was pretty magical and uh, very successful. And um, most recently, um, I've reformed a, uh, a consulting company and production company, actually very recently, like a month and a half ago. And um, <laughs> it's kind of on hold because of yeah. the virus yeah, situation. Well. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's really a, a culmination of everything I've done since, you know, the, really the mid-60s. Yeah. And um, I'm excited about it. And when you think about... Uh our careers together, we have great timing just to think about you know, a couple months before this pandemic breaks out to come up with these great and exciting ideas. And then it puts us on hold or so people think. I know you're probably a lot like me, Lee. You eat, drink and sleep this stuff. And you're probably working on the next major uh, event or the next major project that uh, you have planned. Right. You, you yeah, understand. absolutely. Uh, I'm constantly on conference and Zoom calls, but more importantly, uh, taking this time to really 
plot and plan and lock and load. So when this thing's over, ready to, I mean, completely go nuclear with it. So yeah. it's been the downtime has been in many respects kind of uh, productive in that I'm able to. Um, yeah really uh, focus a lot and, yeah. uh, and get ready for the uh, the new era that emerges. Well, you know, there really is no downtime for most of us if we're working on our craft and thinking about what's going to happen in a few months or a few weeks from now. you you got to be uh, the type of person who can anticipate very well, and that's been your entire career. You talk about the early days of AOR, and you talk about those groups that you embraced and religiously backed on the radio and really didn't worry about the quote-unquote hits per se because you you had respect for the audience and i think along the way radio and you uh alluded to this in the article that you did with um radio inc i think it is yeah in in which we sort of went off the path as what we do as broadcasters so why don't you spend a little time about your criticism of the medium and and where it is now and maybe suggest where it possibly can go well, I think uh, you look back to the uh, sort of the, the second golden age of radio in the 60s and 70s, and uh, it was electric. It was Technicolor. Uh, stations had amazing production. There were uh, personalities in all day parts rather than a morning show and then autopilot the rest of the day. And uh, really, stations embraced the, most stations embraced the music. If an artist would come to a city, they'd actually go to the radio station and play. When a new release came out, it was celebrated by the stations. And the stations were not only the soundtrack of the streets, but also um, the Bible of music. You know, that's, back then stations had uh, printed playlists, which people would pick up at record stores and, and see what's number one. And there was just an excitement about, uh, about radio. And I think since consolidation... And uh, the overbearing re- reliance on data and research, it's really gotten off, off course from what, you know, golden magical radio is all about. And I think it has to be reinterpreted for the 21st century, but those same characteristics are still as valid as ever, which is, you know, theater of the mind production that really mm-hmm. transports you. And... Uh, you know, personalities outside of morning drive. And it doesn't have to be the traditional radio personalities, DJ. They can be just all sorts of characters, uh, but, you know, really interesting voices, uh, you know, throughout the day. And I know it's expensive and all that, but, you know, it's one of the things I think uh, stations that can afford to need to invest in. And, uh, boy, get back to, I mean, Spotify's and the Apple's and satellite radio are killing uh, the credibility of music with FM radio. It's, uh, it's not the place you go and get inspired and uh, turn down to new, new music. And um, I think it's really, again, uh, and we, I actually like listening to old air checks just to see how it was done back then and how it can be reinterpreted for today. But it's really about bringing back all those characteristics that just uh, made radio the soundtrack of America. And it's particularly critical now for FM stations, uh, especially, to get back on the creative bandwagon because there's so much competition from the streaming services, from satellites, and from whatever other technology is going to emerge, which I'm sure there will be another one. And they should be on, you know, creative high gain right mm-hmm. now. And in fact, they tend to be kind of asleep and on autopilot and. Um, when a station launches, it used to be like a... Uh, an event. Like, I'm sorry? It used to be an event. Oh, yeah, and the planning that went into it was a uh, Schwarzkopf-like. You know, it was uh, weeks and weeks, if not months, of preparation, staff uh, motivation and training, and uh, even though the station visual logo, you know, would go through several iterations till it was right, and then, you know, they pulled the trigger, and it was, wow... Now, the station might change in 24 hours. Just slap on some tested music and maybe get a morning show and throw up some billboards and expect it's over. It's, um, it's been condensed to the point where it's, again, autopilot instead of uh, 
just uh, the creating something special and magical, and, uh, and uh, as you say, an event. Well, as you know, Lee, I've been working on some ideas I, for almost two almost. years, and uh, we're on the same page with many of the points that you go over in the article um, from Radio Inc. And we'll go over those a little bit now. I I don't want to make this about what our plans are exactly, because the worst thing you can do is when you're fighting in a war is let the enemy know your battle plan. Yeah, that's and I, true. I, 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 I have to, and we all have to do this as professionals, we have to guard our our creativity and, and use it in the proper place and wait before we make our attack. It's the art of war. And luckily I was in the military. I don't know about you, but um, yeah, those are the things that I learned. Don't let the enemy know what you're doing and figure out what they're doing so that you can anticipate and make your moves. And now's the optimum time to invest in broadcast companies when everybody's yeah, that's fleeing. Yeah, a great analogy. Uh, yeah. So true. Now's the time to go in. Uh, having, yeah. said, having said that, one of the things that I've always had a problem with, me as a personality, Lee, you know how many times I've been fired for being a personality outside of Morning Drive? I always thought it was ludicrous that only the morning guy could be the personality of the radio station. And boy, if you were ever funnier than the morning guy, it was the game was over for you. You were out, you were packing your bags. One thing I do love about you is you're really not um, too predictable. And what I mean by that, it's a story many years ago. It was in the late 80s. You were at Z Rock in Dallas. And right. I, I was trying to figure out where I was going to go next in my radio career. So I sent you a fax. Hey, Lee, hire me. Well, that's all it took. I got a call from your program director. Lee wants to hire you. Can you come and do part time? I'm like, man really like to do that but you know moving from new york to dallas with part-time i don't think i could ever afford to live like that so uh you know but it 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 really made a lifelong impression i think that when you and i had a call in private with another guy it's one of those stories that stuck with me yeah that's cool yeah um yeah that's uh yeah, it comes back to overthinking you know you hear something or a person that's right you know go for it we call it AFDI, actually frigging doing it, although the frigging can be replaced with yeah, another word. I got you. Well, and, and, and then as I was trying to get a job, this is really funny. I would try to get the attention of yeah. the program director. So one time I sent a uh, gorilla with balloons over to some guy in Charlotte. He called me up. He goes, got no openings, but I certainly love the gorilla gram. Uh, another time I went to a, a gun range and I got a target. And man, when I was in the Army, man, I was a great shot. So I blew the whole middle out of the uh, the, the silhouette. I mailed it to Ken Anthony. Uh, he was a program director in Los Angeles. And I, I said, hire me and I'll blow away the competition. Well, I think I scared him. So I didn't get a call. Back <laughs> then another time I sent the sneaker in the mail. I said, hey, listen, here's one foot in the door. Can I bring my other along with me? Uh, you know, I was really creative and thought outside of the box. That's why I sent you the facts. I was always trying to like get their attention because... How, how do you like get through that stack of resumes and tapes? Now, it's completely different nowadays, Lee, in how you try to get a job. So let's make this about a young broadcaster listening to this segment. You got Lee Abrams, and he is the guru of radio programming, one of the best program directors ever. How would a young person now get the attention of someone like Lee Abrams? Well, it's uh, you know it starts by sending me an email and uh, let's hear what you have to say. And if it's an air personality, you know, it, um, a uh, recording of either what they do or what they would like to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes that's real important because they might be doing something that isn't really what they're all about. And if they can make a demo of here's how I really see myself at my station I'm currently at, um, won't let me. Um, that's, that's a good thing. So, but initially it's a, just an email. That's all it takes and we can start communication. That's a good thing. And at least you're approachable. A lot of guys I remember would never answer the phone growing up. And that was always really, uh, frustrating for me. That's why I'd have right. to resort to sending a singing gorilla. Um, the other thing, if you're listening and you're thinking about making that move, a lot of people have been quote unquote dislocated. We won't even go there, but when you're trying to make that air check, If there's a station that you really want to work at, it doesn't take much effort at all to fake like you're there. You know, that's how I got a few jobs. I pretended like I was on the staff and I made my own customized demo, much like you have to make that own 
uh, customized resume. If it's really important to you, if this is what your passion is all about, then you have to transmit that to the person who might be making the decision. And you might not get the yes right away, but you have to be consistent and you got to keep in contact. I mean, nobody ever really got upset with somebody who kept in contact with them unless it was too much. You call them three or four times a day and stuff like that. Let it lie. You know, every couple of weeks, check in. And if you don't hear from them and they hired somebody else, wait a few months. Go, hey, man, just wanted to, you know, reconnect, see how you're doing and create a relationship. And that yep. will help you get that next job. You have to have a lot of patience. Boy. Yeah, that, that's a good plan. And uh, yeah, stalking is one thing, but uh, yeah, being patient and consistent, uh, very important. And eventually it might uh, might pan out. All right. We're with Lee Abrams. I'm Zach Martin. We're talking about Lee's career and his take on the present conditions in radio. Look over the past and how it applies today. I was thinking about this this morning and I wanted to bring this up to you because you you uh, bring this up in this article here. Guerrilla tactics. And before you give your insight on that, I remember when I was a kid, the prized item from any radio station was the T-shirt. And I thought, well, why did they give out T-shirts? And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's right. A walking billboard. You want people to evangelize your product. So if you give them the T-shirt, while you think it's a lot of money out of your budget, it really makes a lot of sense because you convert those people and you get them to get out in front and say, hey, listen, this is what I listen to. You should listen to it as well. So those T-shirts, although they've been put on the back burner, I think are really important to promote your radio station, have walking billboards and advocates. What would you say about that, Lee? Yeah, I think um, the key with uh, T-shirts or stickers is uh, not just slapping it together, but investing in the art so it's really cool and almost collectible. Uh, Taking a um, page out of the the rock band book, you know, most uh, bands uh, have really cool logos and uh, you know, are pretty artful in their visual presentation. They don't just slap on a logo. Uh, and I would say the same thing is important for um, for T-shirts. You can also number them, make them collectible. So, you know, I got all 30 of them. Uh, yeah. And, and change them out every year. I remember being at a station once, uh, and the uh, program director called the, uh, was, uh, called, I guess, promotion manager, sales manager, and said, are we doing T-shirts this year? And he said, yeah. I said, well, what are they going to look like? I don't know, same as last year. It's like, no, you know, take, if you're going to circulate something, make it, you know, artistically current and really the cool factor. Right. Find so a local. Same thing with stickers. You can find a local artist to work with, which, uh, you know, really penetrates the community. Here's a thing that we did at 98 Rock in Baltimore. We had Spit Happens Baby Bibs. (laughs) We thought about, you know, wicked cool shirts and things like that. So we were always trying to come up with creative ways to engage people with our brand. I mean, the Spit Happens Baby Bibs, it's been 30 years, Lee. I still remember that. I thought that was funny. We had onesies as well. That's good stuff. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, that's great. (laughs) And and believe me, it's a lot cheaper than a a billboard, which, by the way, I don't even think people can read them when they drive these days. You can't text on, on your phone. They want you to read a billboard. It's crazy. Yeah, right. I know. And they're all pretty lame anyway. Uh, so and, and, I agree. And the other thing that you bring up is production. Now, let me just say this. I would not hire anybody. for the, now, now, there's different levels. If it's a person just breaking into the business, I understand that they're not going to have good production um, skills, but it's my job to teach them. By and large, I don't care if you're Howard Stern. I don't care if you're the greatest uh, on-air personality of all time. This is how I I run things. I will not even hire you unless you're good at production. To me, you have to be good at those production skills because now you're requiring people to go in and produce things on your behalf, but it's sort of like don't order people and don't ask people to do things that you're not willing to do yourself. That's a real stickler for me. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, the key, and you said something, uh, teach them. Uh, The key is aptitude and willingness and just a... you know, where sound is in their DNA, and you can develop that. And um, but the key is, you know, they gotta think in Technicolor and hear things in stereo, and uh, just have that theater of the mind um, attitude toward things. And uh, if they have that, even if they're uh, pretty green, that that can be developed into something pretty uh, pretty cool. 
I like how you say the Technicolor and you listen to the old production of the, let's say, 50s and 60s. And do you realize that I think Reese Mann did a bit about radio production one time where he's got all these carts and tapes and stuff like that and it was driving him nuts, making him a shug, you know, all the mashug and his stuff. Um, <laughs> it, the, people don't realize how hard it was to do that, that type of production. And nowadays you really have no excuse because you have multi-digital uh, recording. It's very simple. It's inexpensive. You can really be creative. You can really be uh, well organized. Uh, you have all of these production libraries. Uh, back in my day when I first started, Lee, we, we didn't even have a razor blade. Some guy taught me how to cut tape with a scissors and scotch tape. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, tools for production have really evolved. That uh, can only help things. But they certainly make it boring by just doing this slap, slap this together real quick kind of stuff. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's just slapping together a promo, you know, or an interstitial. It's... It's like, again, part of the autopilot radio's on. Instead of really uh, taking the time and having the mind to do it right. Uh, people say, you know, oh, it's expensive. You know, thinking creatively costs nothing. You just got to bring in the people, liberate them, and right. teach them, and uh, let them go. And, and I, amazing I, things can happen. And I do believe the economy of scale is a little bit different. While we'll uh, mostly end up working from remote locations, if you want to call it that, the technology is advanced where I can be on the air from my house. Now, having said that, if I'm on a station like I do in Fresno, when I'm on in Fresno, I'm on in Fresno. My mind is Fresno. I'm all about Fresno. I learn about the city. I say hi to people in Fresno. I talk about the police officers and the fire stations. I embrace the local artist. I understand who the local artist is that made it big from that area. So make sure that we highlight them. And it, it, radio can still have its intimacy, even though you're 3,000 miles apart. Yeah, just thinking the right way and instead of, uh, again, instead of autopilot, just uh, considering the community you're talking to and engaging in it. Do you think that uh, because of consolidation, radio's lost that tie with the communities that they are supposed to serve? Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of denial going on that oh, we serve the community, and they don't. I mean, there are exceptions. There are some stations that are very locally focused, uh, certainly some of the big AM stations, you know, the WLWs type stations. But generally speaking, you could travel from Chicago down to Florida and go through Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Palm Beach, and hit Miami. All the stations would sound pretty much the same. Because I'm saying that because I remember taking as a little kid that same trip, and every town sounded different. You know, right down to the accents and the, uh, you know, just the, the vibe of the station really just uh, was completely uh, city related. You knew where you were. And now it's very generic. Again, you take that same trip and everybody sounds the same, the same voice guys, the same production, the same music, the same everything. And uh, so, yeah, I think radio, generally speaking, has really lost its uh, sense of community. Uh, and there are, again, there are exceptions, but, you know, I, I see very few stations really doing it right. And just to rephrase what you stated in that article from Radio Inc., we're with Lee Abrams, it's sort of a, a disrespect to the local community at, at the audience. You're, you're not being respectful. You're not considering the audience when you do stuff like that. No, nah, you're just going through the motions and, uh, you know, playing the hits and <laughs> and keeping it pretty vanilla and safe and uh, hoping people uh, engage with that, which they are less and less. So I find a lot of ra radio has lots of users, but doesn't have many fans. Yeah. Other than you know the Howard Stearns and stuff, yeah, but well, uh, yeah. you know a lot of users, and that's radio's job to turn users into fans. I mean, again, when did, we were talking earlier. When was the last time you saw a radio station bumper sticker? You know, it used to be people's flag. Now it's very rare well, when you see one. Yeah, but the only thing with that, Lee, is I, I have. <laughs> you know, the older you get, your toys are more expensive. So I, I just can't see putting a sticker on my Dodge Challenger RT or my Charger for that matter. Or if I had a Mercedes or a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, BMW. However, I remember working at an oldie station down in Atlantic City. And what we came up with were these, you know how when you get your oil changed, those things that go in your windshield, they stick Oh, sure. There's, there's an option for you. Put that in your window. Like it's, 
Make it collegiate. That's a cool well, idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. This way you don't like degrade your vehicle. I just oh that it's always gotten me. But hey, you got those NASCAR fans. They love stickers. So I guess it's it's each market. Yeah, and you see a thing. lot of baby on board stickers and my my daughter's a honor student at George Washington High and things like that. So uh there's still some stickers out there on uh, maybe on less than premium cars, but to, they're out there. And you know, when when you think about the audience uh, that listens to a station in New York or in L.A. or in the small town Tarot, Indiana, just throwing that out there, um, COVID nineteen is different to each part of the country. So yeah, like much like you said, when you take that drive, what COVID nineteen means over here in New York City completely different from somebody that might be in, um, let's make a place, um, uh, Champaign, Illinois. Uh, I don't know what's going on there, but, you know, uh, I think that that's another indication that we're on the wrong path with this consolidation. It can, to think that everybody's suffering equally. We're all in this together. I really hate when I hear that on the radio these days. No, we're not. (laughs) We're not in a cliche. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, the, these trying situations, uh, you know, be a team, all of that stuff. It's, it's, you know, after a while, you say, well, what a bunch of hogwash. I think they're just saying it to say it. Uh, my approach has been during this to give people an escape from those problems going on. I'll say something like, hey, I got my hat and gloves and my uh, mask on. I'm playing doctor on a radio uh, just to make fun of it. Uh, you know, a lot of people are taking it seriously. But, you know, it's supposed to be that escape. You, you, you know what I used to really love, Lee, was when I would put on the radio station and maybe it was Scott Meany or some guy at night and they would just do a music marathon and you hear the jock every once in a while. And I thought to myself, man, this, this jock, he's cool. He's putting this together and he just like letting it roll and I'm rocking. I'm having a great time. And then he'd speak a little. I'm like, wow, I'd like to do that. That guy sounds so cool. He play a couple spots and they get right back to it. Um, now it's more like, uh, it's too chopped up for me when I listen to the radio. Uh, oh yeah. Too many damn commercials. I think the commercials, we got to stop this 30 and 60 second commercial kind of buy. Get them a 15 second, by all means, instead of putting the phone numbers of the company on there, put your website on it. We can remember websites. We can yes, remember that all phone needs numbers. to be rethought too. Yeah. One of the many components that requires rethought. All right, Lee. So as we look at the radio industry coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic, I don't know if it's ever going to be normal again. I mean, we, we experienced nine 11, but this is completely different. When you look at radio in the next, give us a, an idea of what it looks like to you in the next three months, six months, and then just give us up to two years. We don't have to go five. It's re- yeah, really I think, uh, won't see much difference in the three months, uh, in six months. I think there'll be a uh, fewer, fewer people involved. I think, uh, these big, uh, the bigger companies are going to, uh, Go through more furloughs and more um, more relocations or firings, whatever you want to call it. So I think uh, it'll, stations will get more automated and more disconnected. But in uh, two years, I see the emergence of online radio mm-hmm. really uh, taking hold. You know, the Apples and the Spotify's doing real radio will be uh, a game changer. So I think. Um, Assuming FM radio doesn't really uh, rethink itself, reimagine itself, I'm assuming it won't, uh, it'll just continue down the same path with fewer people and uh, more automation and uh, more vanilla, whereas uh, the real excitement will be on uh, on the Internet side where there's um, you know fewer rules and the playbook is kind of going to be rewritten uh, and it'll be a lot different and very exciting. I think satellite radio will continue to hold steady and uh, do real well. They invest a lot in brands and personalities and uh, obviously Howards and people like that. Um, so I think they'll uh, they'll be very steady and probably even grow a little bit. But, uh, you know, again, I don't have much faith in uh, FM and AM radio. Um mm-hmm. I wish I did because, you know, I grew up with it and love it, and uh, it's been a great trip. But, um, you know, I think the excitement is going to be on other other platforms. Let me just say this. You know I'm prepared to fire the shot across the bow, and it's coming. So at least in my neighborhood, in my line of thinking, I've got some plans. Again, I don't want to say what they are, but you kind of get 
an insight about that from previous conversations we've had off the air, right? Right. I think I am on to something because I look at, when you look at business, and then we'll wrap this up, when you look at business overall, when you're trying to enter the marketplace, there's a thing called barrier to entry. My idea has a low barrier to entry. I'm already on the online sector, and I've taken uh, that online radio station, I've done very interesting things with it. Um, What I find is you could merge that with your on-air product and take care of your artist performance fees and licensing fees, which is a real big part of it. Once you figure that aspect out, boy, you're off to the races. But tabling that, you have to have the app. Then you got to get your app and Apple CarPlay. And then you use your over-the-air signal, that aggregate, and that's something that is strength. And remember this, Lee, the agencies still want to buy radio. And even when you present digital, they go, we want radio. I'm like, okay, fine. So I know what some of the rules are. You got to think of low barrier to entry. And then on a personal level, when you lose your job, I have a lot of experience uh, with this, Lee. I don't know about you, but plenty of times I've been shown the door. Um, I worked at one radio station where it was a revolving door. Remember 106.7 KZY in Denver? Oh, sure. Revolving door. Anyway, um, uh, you can't get down on yourself. And if you really have a passion for what you do, you got to do it because you enjoy it, not because it's all about the money. The money will come. And even if it is about the money, you have to learn how to supplement your income and still do what you love to do. And then don't go negative. Don't say a lot of bad things about people. Have a few people that you can go to and say whatever you want, but keep it to yourself. Be very careful what you post on social media. That I completely agree with those points. So derail your career, especially stay away from politics. You know, really, it, this to me Lee, is is amazing that how how everybody's an expert on every single facet of every subject because they're the only ones who have Google and can and can look it up. So that's right. That, that's my <laughs> advice. Just be very careful what you post. Sometimes I post something and I'm like, no, 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 I better not post that. <laughs> sometimes yeah, right. sometimes I do post it and like, you know something. I have to make this little point, but it's always in one sentence, so they really can't clobber me on it. Um, yes. You know, so nobody's asking you not to be who you are, but just be guarded. Be careful what you say. And try, yep, to, be, try to be friends with everybody and help others. If you start helping others, they're going to want to help you. And that's how you create fans. What's some of your advice before uh, we go, Lee? Well, uh, again, I, I'll uh, mirror with a lot of what you said. I think uh, staying, picking yourself up, staying very positive. Uh, reaching out to people, networking as much as possible, selling yourself, um, and really investigating places that could use your talent, even if it's not radio. It could be an ad agency or uh, or some allied business. Um, and just, you know, get back into action and uh, start moving immediately. And But the most important thing, don't get down. It's just, you know, fact of life. It's a business we chose, and this stuff happens more now than ever before. But um, you know, if you, again, if you're really passionate about it and you have ideas, uh, get to the right people, stay positive, and uh, stay energetic. Oh, sorry, and just keep at it. All right, fantastic, Lee. How can anybody get in touch with you if they need to get in touch with the great Lee Abrams? Uh, the best thing is uh, email, which is n one zero one x m at gmail.com and 101xm at gmail all right thank you very much lee i'll tell you what we'll do we'll we'll regroup in a couple of weeks we'll do another one of these things and maybe we'll have an update we'll have more insight for sure we'll know where we're going by then because uh, i i think that more things are going to start to open up again really fast and the conditions are going to change at the pace so it'll be great to uh check in with you from time to time and maybe what we can do is eventually develop something that would be useful as we move forward that other professionals in broadcasting can take some of this information and go with it sounds great to me all right lee thank you so much for your time i really do appreciate it thank you enjoyed it bye-bye